Thanks very much for the opportunity to speak and um, um, just a little bit of a little bit of additional background. I, I've worked in a range of councils, most specifically, I guess, local to this Kringai for about um, uh, about nine years. I was up there, and part of that role was significantly trying to think about how governments, and in, in the case of uh, specifically local government, actually deals with this really. Uh, interesting area of urban trees and I guess part of that has kicked on to some other work I did with the uh, New South Wales Environmental Trust a couple of years ago where we where we thought pretty hard about this with some landscape architects, some urban designers, um, some scientists and so forth and, and some of this material that I'll talk about tonight goes on that and I guess some, um, I've got some other thoughts. Um, so essentially we're really going to talk about trees in urban spaces. And I wasn't quite sure that, like, how long I had to speak, and it's about 45 minutes, but I've got enough for about two hours. <coughs> yeah, so you're laughing now. All right. So what we're really thinking about today or tonight is about where trees are in landscape. What are the trends uh, that are uh, affecting our urban landscape, and particularly our green landscapes? And so often when I've spoken to groups like this, I'm preaching to the converted. So it's, it's a pretty easy audience. And so I'll, I might sort of push you a little bit uh, sometimes. But I also want us to think about how we manage the urban forest and actually who owns it. And I think often we like to point to ownership and management and responsibility. This trees are somebody else's problem, particularly if they fall over or they're just about to fall over or there's a bushfire coming. And so just to declare of interest, I live next to a national park and I'm in a bushfire prone area, but I have lots of trees. So I'm, not, I'm prepared to wear that risk. So just to make sure that there's no um, hypocrisy going on here. So when I was thinking about what this particular council or, or local government area is, and you know, you're, you're still a, a, an agglomeration of three councils, so not all your policies are consistent, and I'm, I'm sure you're aware of that. But uh, Warringah certainly in its day had some uh, urban forest policy outcomes. And primarily that was really, this is going back, back a while, but it was at the very early edge of good urban policy um, recognition. Now Melbourne, if you're going to look at a particular uh, local government jurisdiction, Melbourne City Council really is the one that's shown some great leadership, but they're in a different situation, like Sydney City. So for them to plant a tree in an urban streetscape costs about, and it's really hard to get them to give, get them to give you a, a, an exact figure, about 10,000 bucks a tree. Oh, shit, you say. Um, and it is a lot of money because there's lots of services underground. You've got to put an advanced tree. You've got to look after it for a year or two. So there's all these additional costs that go into planting a tree. So you're giving them away tonight. So, so, so just, you know, I, I want you to think about what are the real costs for a local government to get this right. Because we also know, and I've got some colleagues who worked out in um, uh, um, Western, past of Western Sydney, where the council had done a lot of great tree planting. It didn't engage with the residents. Next morning, the trees were pulled out. Oh, God. So, uh, because people's values are different. Yep, so I can capture your values. You, you love trees. The ones that don't aren't here. So, so when we... <coughs> So when we start to think about how do we prosecute the case for more urban trees, for a greener urban environment, it's not you who I should be talking to. Yeah, there we go, we've got that track, so you can go home, speak to finish. So when we start to think about um, how your canopy cover's going, it's, I think the French expression would be bloody good. You have a really healthy canopy by way of percentage cover. You know, you've got, you're gifted with a whole bunch of national parks. You're gifted with a whole bunch of bushland reserves. You're gifted with pretty large uh, lot sizes. And you're also gifted with a good climate and soil that supports your trees. So it's not surprising that your canopy covers are uh, almost second to none across urban areas. But when we start to think about the vulnerability and this is an eye test specifically for you at the back. So, um, so really what we're thinking, what we're looking at in this particular slide is if you're on the five scale, you've got lots of trees and you're hanging on to them. 
as opposed to the zero scale, you've got nothing and whenever you try to plant them, they get pulled out. So you're not fantastic in, on the northern beaches, but certainly you're pretty good. And the reason that you've got this vulnerability rating, rating here is because there's a tendency for you, you being the whole local government area, is to pull them out, to chop them down. Now that can be bushfire prone reasons, it can be uh, increasing urban densification, or a, whole, or a whole range of other issues. So what you find is this tension between planting and cutting. And that's going to keep going for a long time, and that's why I'm here talking to you, so you can talk to the people who aren't here and tell them to stop cutting. You're grouped with the hill shy, you're grouped with cogra, for example. Now, when I think of urban, urban canopy cover, cogra is not the local government area that comes to mind. No, because probably the trees that they plant, they're not pulling out. Now, there's something to talk to your neighbours about. So, when we start to accept that we're losing a lot of our trees, I think we should think about why we have them in the first place. And so, and I'll talk about, about a whole range of environmental benefits, a whole range of social and economic benefits here. And, and what I've tried to do, because I'm an academic, I've got to give justification um, and supporting studies. Not all academic literature agrees, and we can talk about other things after um, where there's contention later on. But we know trees reduce air pollution. But you're on the coast here, your air's pretty good. If I was in Western Sydney, except for the last couple of days, granted, yep, yep. Yeah, well, I live in, um, I live in Taramara. I've been, I've been having a lot of cigarettes, apparently, with, with all this smoke. So when we start to think about trees reducing air pollution, particularly if, if you're on a major road, it's a fantastic natural asset. It does, its, it does the work for you. We've got clearly the ecological benefits of habitat provision. We start to think about the connectivity between big forested areas and, and bushland reserves. We have trees promote soil health. We start to think about trees in managing the urban heat island. Again, less relevant here, far, far more relevant once you get west or Parramatta and west thereof. When we start to think about water, now water is something northern beaches people love and really focus on. So trees can help reduce stormwater pollution. They absorb that they take the, I'll say the nasties for lack of other word, and can make, if, if you have enough of them with good soil, um, your waterways healthier. Um, sequestering carbon, so you know, often we have these discussions around uh, carbon mitigation. Trees do a little bit, but urban trees, we just don't have enough of them. So it's a bit of a furphy to put a lot of strength into the carbon sequestration. When we start to think about some of the social benefits, now I'm not quite sure, I've got to go back to this study, but some of you are clear, you know, you're looking good for your age here because you've got lots of trees. You know, normally I'd look around the audience, you know, you're all about 90, but here you're looking about 80. You know? So it can make you feel younger and make you richer, or at least feel you, make you feel richer. So we start to see these things as biophilic design, if you like. And so we know that connection with the green bits of nature is good for us. And so there are studies that start to provide that empirical evidence just to guide and give that justification. We know for kids, if you get them to climb a tree, it's far better than climbing a monkey bar. There are other sort of innate skills that they'll learn in terms of fine balance. So there are social benefits. We live on the northern beaches, you should have more trees because we get too much UV. We also know that having trees encourages people to walk. Now, I've got another project that I'm doing at the moment. We're trying to, about active transport and getting people to use the metro. And so we know people, for example, who use public transport just do more exercise than those who drive. So there's a whole bunch of co-benefits that you can drive out of that. But we also know in order for you to catch public transport, you actually need to have a nice environment to go from your front door to your bus stop. And if there's no trees, no shade, no nice place, you go, bugger it, I'm going to drive. And so the, the amenity value, and particularly this is one for local government, trees are really important in enabling uh, people to have healthy places to live. So we can have other things about reducing stress and um, anxiety, and we can get trees to, uh, to connect people with nature. 
So there's some other evidence around, and I've touched on air quality before and of, of um, air temperature, but there's this tension around vegetation and traffic. So when I talk to traffic engineers, trees are bad. Yeah, they, because, you know, sight lines, etc., etc. et, cetera, et cetera. Um, And there is some evidence on that. But we also know well-designed streets, good boulevards, will ask you as a driver to slow down. And the slower you go, the safer you, go, the safer you are. So there's some implicit tensions around having no trees for sight, uh, sight lines, etc., and having vegetation in a way that supports better driving. So when we start to think about the economic benefits, a landscape can improve the value of your house, can improve the value of a shop. For your local shops that you have here in Avalon, if you have a nice place, a nice environment, shoppers will hang around for longer. The longer they hang around, the more they stand. So there's an inherent value and a positive feedback where we start to think about that in terms of good urban design. So when we think about um, a tree canopy of Sydney as a whole, this is back in 2011, and basically the darker the green here, the more the, more the vegetation, the more the, the more the colour. So again, where you're sitting on the, on the top uh, up here is pretty good, as opposed to the majority parts of Sydney. And again, specifically, this is where we're going to put about a million people. So when we start to think about what this means in terms of canopy cover, the Premier has at least put as one of her priorities planting 5 million trees by 2030. So individually there are councils that are committed to doing their own little bit to, to get to that level. But what I, and I'll, I'll come back to this, is it's fine to have those targets and it's great and it's aspirational, but you've got to stop the cutting. Because we know, and I'll, and I'll use this example time and time again uh, tonight, Hornsby are losing just as many trees as, as they're planting, and arguably more. And they've got a great tree planting program. And that's not a go at Hornsby, this is just what happens. So, from an environmental perspective, if we can get this canopy cover up, we're going to make many parts of, city, of, of Sydney, and particularly the parts that need it most, probably about a, uh, almost 1.5 degrees cooler. You say, well, that's not very much. I'd ask you the difference between 40 and 30, you know, 38. I'll take 38 any day. So when we start to think about the variability in our trees, and again, I'm sort of using a little bit of data that I've, I did some work for Hornsby Council as part of their urban, canopy, um, uh, urban forest strategy um, earlier this year. So in Hornsby, they're losing about 2 to 3% of their trees a year. Cumulative. Yep. Every year the same things. And so that equates to about, if I remember, what's it, 10,000? No, 12,000 to 15,000 trees a year. They're mature trees too. They are the mature trees too. They're the ones that you can, that you can cut down and that you can see on LIDAR or, or um, spatial, spatial techniques to then map and, and, and uh, get a sense of. So concurrently, the council has got a commitment to planting 25,000 trees by 20, what is it, 20, 2020, which is next year. So you just do the maths. Yep. This, they're treading water. So we start to see this real tension of having great policy at the local government level, great proactive strategy, but our regulatory environment, our compliance process, the way that we enact our tree, our tree preservation orders, the, the way that we think about the clearing and the permissibility of clearing trees is something that we need to spend more time on as well as promoting the more planting. So we also know there's high variability across our urban forest. So just again using Hornsby, um, because this is the, sort of the more granular detail that I, that, I, that I had available. So there are parts of Hornsby that are more tree and there are parts that are less tree. And it's really important to understand this because often people will say, we want all our area to be green. We want all our area to have 40% tree canopy cover. That can't exist. You've got to have commercial industrial areas, but it's really hard to, to, to squeeze in those trees. So that means the other spaces need to work harder. 
the residential spaces need to work harder. So that's the best resolution map that I can have that are of, your, of your local government area. And it's old data. And it's not a criticism, but there's an opportunity to find the new data and just to see how things are changing over time. So when we start to think about canopy cover, now I've, I've put these suburb names in as a guess. So these aren't necessarily at all a representation of what I uh, of, of, of what is the, um, the canopy level, but it's just my, my ballpark when I looked at an, um, some aerial, uh, an aerial photo. So probably in Avalon you're looking at about 40% canopy cover. And again across the Northern Beaches Council, you've got about somewhere between 40 and 60% um, depending on what you measure and how you measure. So you're really good in terms of that overarching canopy cover. You might have some other suburbs, Mona Vale might have a little, a little bit less. You might have Colliery uh, Plateau, Long Reef, medium to low, and then you sort of get down to Balga, you know, the commercial area of Balgala that might have about a uh, 10% canopy cover. And it's not to say that that's a bad, sub, bad site, it's just demonstrating the variability. And there's a need, if you're going to have commercial areas, which you need to for jobs, employment, etc., that means your other R2, low density residential areas, need to think about these things uh, much harder. So if we come back to our Hornsby data, and, and, we'll, and we'll sort of revisit the Northern Beaches as we go. So in terms of the R2 low density, medium, uh, medium density, we've, in Hornsby there's about 33% canopy cover dropping to about 22% as you increase that density, going from your low to your medium density. So there's a clear indication as you start to infill development here, the significance in canopy loss that is what you can expect. It doesn't mean that you can't still have a high canopy. You've just got to work much harder in your landscape controls. Entirely possible, but it's up to the council. So when we st then start to think about streets and roads. So in Hornsby, there was about, um, by way of area, your roads make up about 17% of the Hornsby local government area. Um, now remembering there's some really big national parks in Hornsby. So if I was to hazard a guess, you're probably looking at about 20% of your entire local government area is roads or road reserves here. In an urban, in a much more urban environment, it can be up to 40%. So you start to see start the significance of the road reserve and its contribution to the urban landscape and what, what you can do with it. And the road reserve is not just the black bit. It's the black bit plus the footpath to the property boundary. So we come back to your, your data here and we start to see canopy cover for street trees on northern beaches is about 45%. So if we come back to here in Hornsby, um, you're, you've got about twice the advantage. So there's some really great things in terms of your underlying natural assets and the way that you've managed things in the past that are pretty good. So we start to then think about well, what does this look like for a typical street? And so this is an example up in, um, I think it's on Cherrybrook. Um, and so we start to see what that might look like in terms of getting more street trees involved. And we can get about, you know, five, six percent here. And then we, th then we look at another example in terms of uh, the central business district in and around Hornsby. And you get, you're really struggling because of the impervious area, the paving, the footpaths. It's hard to get that canopy cover. So I'll go back to the example that I used about the $10,000 tree in Melbourne or Sydney City. That's how much it costs realistically to green that high urban landscape, that high commercial retail landscape. It's expensive. And don't kid yourself that it's just planting a $3 tube stop and you can walk away. Then we can have other examples of Malton Road in Beecroft, which is one of those beautiful uh, urban tree, lovely place to live, not unlike Avalon, but without the, without the salty air. So they've got an environment of about 50% of getting that great canopy cover. So these are things that you should aspire to if this is actually what you want as a, as a, as a principle. But when I start to think about what does this all mean, 
So we know our cities are growing. <coughs> and the Greater Sydney Commission tells us and reminds us time and time again our cities need to grow. Now, I can, I can see your eyebrows being raised as, it's, as, as I... And what we know as cities grow, we clear our habitat. That's just what happens. And we fundamentally know when there's a relationship. You clear habitat, you lose biodiversity. It's not linear, but there's some tipping points that are involved. And so when we start to think about biodiversity loss and canopy loss, we're actually also losing a whole bunch of co-benefits. So we started off talking about the environmental benefits, the social benefits, the economic benefits. These are the benefits that you lose by incrementally losing your canopy. We don't value them very much. There's data that we can tease out and draw from other studies, but rarely do we do local-based data. And I can tell you, having worked in local government and state government, decision makers love local-based data and love to ignore the study in anywhere else. <laughs> so, and this is not this is not me passing out the plate for my research for the beaches, um, but it's just the way our minds work. We just like to see and have connection to stuff that we know in locations that we know and are familiar with. So, as we start to lose that, we also know that our policy instruments aren't being informed by the science and the data. It's telling us. So it's telling us, the data tells us people are cutting more trees down. So our urban forest strategies, our tree, pres pres our tree preservation order policies and the way that we enact them, the way that we socialise the loss of trees is something that we haven't got to the root cause of in terms of reform. And that, I guess, speaks to the regulation and compliance. Now, politically, regulation and compliance is sort of like a dirty word. We just don't like to do it. It's not sexy. You know, a person turns up with this sort of official uniform and says you can't do something. And there's something about the Australian psyche that just doesn't really like that. It'll bugger you. Who's watched the castle? Yeah, this is my home. This is my castle. You can just bugger off. Um, that's the way that the national psyche is around that. So we like trees, but we like to reserve the right to do what we want with them. So then we've got to think about other mechanisms. So if you're going to reserve the right to do what you want, then we've got to think about what are your driving values and can we shift those so that you can sort of increase your ownership, your responsibility, and accept that occasionally there's a risk. We all accepted the risk driving here tonight or walking here tonight, without question. And sometimes we also need to accept the risk during bushfire season, during a storm season, um, or, or an event. These are just things that occur. When we start to think about canopy cover, there's a paired issue with canopy, which is the pervious or the impervious, the hard surface areas. So one of the things that we must do within our urban landscape, if we're going to have lots of trees, is to support and enable deep soil planting. For example, we have an underground car park and have 30 centimetres of soil. That won't support a tree. We've got to have deep soil planting to get the roots of the tree to survive and hold steady during times of storm. And without that, then we don't get the benefits of sustaining that large tree or even shrub, and then how that contributes to the overarching green space. So I'd like to see, so this is a, um, local governments love to do these types of surveys. So essentially it's an importance and, satisfac and satisfaction surveys. And, and governments do this because you pay rates to them and they like to see if they're doing the right thing or they need to do other things more differently. And what we typically find is we never satisfied enough with our roads and they're always important. So always local government gets told Spend more money on roads. So you might, not, you might as well not ask that question anymore because it comes up in every, every local government survey that I've ever, ever looked at and been involved in. But when we start to think about the trees, now they pop up here as well. And I had to sort of double check my eye test this afternoon just to highlight this. 
So trees are in that quadrant of, yes, we need to improve. We, being uh, the local council, needs to improve what it's doing. But arguably, not so much as roads. So at least the, the treescape, if you like, is on the list of, should be, um, you know, Little John is performing well at school, but could do better. Yeah. That's really where the trees are sort of going. And that's not to say that you're doing a poor job here. Um, from an importance perspective, it ranks well. From a satisfaction perspective, slightly less, but not too bad. And that's, so that's basically how that data, data works. So when we start to think about that in relation to another council. So you're about on par with Hornsby. So about 90% and you're about 85% thought trees were important or somewhat important. So that's telling you on the whole, people like them. But I still want to reserve the right to cut them down. So in terms of satisfaction, slightly lower. And again, the biggest concern in Hornsby was overdevelopment. Now, you know, without seeing sort of the exact same questions replicated here in the Northern Beaches, I would imagine <coughs> quite similar results would come about. Particularly probably as you move down southward. But when we start to think about values and, and um, perceptions, the interesting issue that came out of Hornsby, and it speaks to this regulation and compliance piece, is was a view that tree protection is excessive. The tree preservation order and other mechanisms like that are too onerous. Now fundamentally these are one of the few mechanisms that council can exercise to seek to protect, manage and stop them being cut down. And if the community is saying no we don't like that, then we're in a little bit of a loss or, or, get, or government is in a bit of a loss as to what are, the, what are the tools or what are the mechanisms that can use to pull some of that activity back. And I've got one of my PhD students working on the role of tree preservation orders and significant trees and they're called heritage trees or iconic trees depending on what jurisdiction you are overseas. And one of the great findings that um, Wendy's coming to is most of the time when we look at a tree and we give it a significance, we place it on a significant tree register or an exceptional tree register, we do so only occasionally for its ecological or botanical value. We do so mostly because it's nice or old or big or, ha or resonates some, somehow to you. Not because it, it serves some great ecological uh, service or function. And so with that in mind, when I think about the urban canopy, a little bit of academic stuff here. You, know, you think about it from a socio-ecological perspective. So trees aren't there just to be green and good for nature. It's about how they relate and connect to you. And that's how we value them and continue to value and look after them. So. I've showed a variation of that slide. We've got a fantastic tree planting program, but they've also got a community who wants to cut and wants to remove. So it raises this question about the roadside reserve and its value. So the importance of the roadside reserve is our lots are getting smaller and our houses are getting bigger. Now that's been a trend that's been going on for a while. Our house size, I think, in the last couple of years started to level off. We've got bigger houses by way of square, um, squares or square metres, than America. Isn't that great? Aren't we proud? Let's make Australia great again. I think it's sort of a variation of the thing. So, um, but what we have, and it was really interesting working in Kuringai Council for, for a while, is the minimum lot size, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk generalities, is about 940 square metres. I mean, there's, there's sort of a plus or minus change. Now, I didn't quite have the time to look up your LEP and look at your minimum lot size down here. 720. 720. Now, you go out to Western Sydney. You go out to Penrith and Blacktown and Liverpool. They're down to 250, 300, 320. So, 
think about the lots that you have to play with and the opportunities that you have to plant are massive in relation to these urban development areas that are being springing up around other parts of metropolitan city. So it's no wonder that you're a dark green area and they're a white <coughs> area if you cast your mind back to that map. So lot size really matters. And if we know our lot sizes are getting smaller, we've got to think about what's the other space available. And that's the road reserve. It could be our parks, it could be our bushland areas, but I sort of take it for granted we do a lot with that anyway. We don't do enough in the roadside reserve. It's contested space. Our stormwater engineers want to put pipes there. Our telecommunications companies want to dig it up and put conduits there. We have our electricity companies want to string power lines across there. We have all of us want to have driveways across our road reserve. We want footpaths, and we should have footpaths because it enables us to walk. Because that's good for us. So when we think about cardiovascular health, you know, and, and I'll use the example of diabetes just at the moment because I met with some health people the other day, if I may just digress. Western Sydney area health, basically west of Parramatta if you like, there's going to be about a million people through there. 50% have diabetes or early onset diabetes. Oh, shit. That's a lot. It costs on average $13,000 per person per year to manage that. What's the significance or what's the nexus there or relationship to trees? No trees, not a nice place to walk, can't walk, always drive, not great or space to have a garden, fast food, cycle down we go, second generation never cooked, gestational, adolescent, diabetes, etc, etc, bad lifestyle. Now I'm not saying trees will solve the problems, but we need to think about these co-benefits on good, urban, livable spaces. And I can't underestimate that. So we start to think about, from, uh, from a, a conception perspective, who mows their front garden, their front lawn? All of us probably do. Now there was a period, uh, Ron Honig, who was the Mayor of Botany Council, and for many years, and I think it was the only council in Australia, for a long period of time, the council mowed your front lawn. Yeah, yeah, so you start writing to council to say, yeah, oh, I pay my rates, and so you mow my grass. Sorry, those of you who work in local government for that. <coughs> but when we come to the question about the tree that's planted in the front lawn, who, who looks after that? Well, that's bloody council's responsibility. So we accept a shared responsibility for some parts of the green environment, but not all of it. So we probably need to think about what does that look like in terms of our own amenity and landscape. Because we know the pressures of local government and the expectations of local government with rate capping and a whole bunch of other things that they have to do are far in excess of what they're able to do, which is why they do those satisfaction um, surveys all the time, just to find, oh shit, how are we going to balance everything? So it then begs the question about what can you do as a resident in terms of managing that street birch. So there's lots of examples of good policies that start to inform and direct. Sydney City, City Council's got some great stuff. Um, we have this really interesting, and this is not random, I can't remember where I took that photo um, or got that photo from, but we have issues where people just will not mow their front lawn. Pride? Obstinance? I get a dino. Um, and so what does the council do? Issue an order for them to go and mow the public reserve? Or has to do it themselves? So we have this value question. It's really important that I think we've got to unpack. And so, as a neighbour, if I was a neighbour of that place, oh, buggy, a bloody gym, I'll mow it. Yeah. yeah, that's probably the response. But, again, I'm speaking to a certain audience. So when we start to think about 
this question about how does that apply to street trees. And I go back to the Liverpool example that I mentioned earlier. They planted a whole bunch of trees. The residents said, no, we don't like them. And they pulled them out. Oh, so, so we need to engage with our community. And our community are just as diverse as our vegetation. Some people will come from <coughs> ethnic backgrounds where they have never had a tree. That's not their fault. It's perhaps our fault that we haven't encouraged them to say, well, trees are no, pretty good things to have, and this is how you look after them. I remember a neighbour of mine, um, Korean background, uh, was, uh, moved on since, but had a garden and said, how do I garden? Now, it's a really interesting question. and we, I, mean, you know, I, I, I sort of laughed in my own mind, but I didn't laugh, laugh to her when she asked the question. But if it's completely foreign, the concept of gardening, which you take for granted, you know, your parents would have done it, and sort of intuitively that got passed on to you, etc. But if that's never been a social norm, then how and who is going to create that? I don't know. So when we start to think about this, um, and I'll, sort of, I'll probably start to wrap up because I've only got about an hour to go. So, um, <clears throat> so this notion, there's, you know, there's this old bloke, old white bloke, called Ebenezer Howard, who came up with this idea of the garden city in the UK. And essentially it was around having good environments. Um, and Walter Burley Griffin, you know, I was down in Canberra a couple of weeks ago and one of the things that I like about Canberra, and when you go down there, I'll point this out, it'll reveal itself. So Canberra has a policy for R2, low density residential, of no front fences, which, which I never noticed until I sort of had to look this up. And so essentially what that, what that did, and it's the Walter, Walter Burley Griffin, or probably his wife who did most of the work, intellectual work behind this, but let's just leave gender uh, aside for the moment. So one of the issues around the landscape was this seamless transition from the private to the public sphere. And so when we think about that for, for the purpose of street trees, often what we do, we stick a front fence to say, this is mine and that's yours. And probably the best location for a street tree is right where your fence is. So one of the things that we can start to think about is from an urban design perspective is reimagining our suburbs without the front fence. Without that fence that says, this is mine, that's yours, bugger off. Maybe we don't really mean that by our front fence, but certainly I've seen some front fences that describe that. So we can think about those controls from a planning control, but it would take generational change to actually implement that policy. So we know houses stick around for about 30, 40 years. They get knocked down, yep, no front fence, replaced. So you need to normalise that as a social design, an urban, an urban construct. This is what it means in this particular suburb. And you can experiment in parts of the suburb or a council could. So um, where I'll finish with is this notion of a principal agent problem. And essentially what that is, is around who owns, in the case of the tree, at a certain point in time, or who has responsibility for it. And another piece of work by one of my um, students applied this to green roofs uh, in some of the really large um, environmental buildings. So uh, the architect comes along and sells the vision to the council. I'm going to build this fantastic casino with a green roof, perhaps, um, and sells that architectural vision. Well, we might get a star architect to come along and, and sell that hard, hard. And they do so to get the planning approval, to convince the bankers to loan the money, to get some financial backing and support, to get some community support behind the development. And then what we also find is those architects go, Okay, or, or the owner or the uh, developer goes, oh, we can't keep it affording this architect, so let's just get somebody cheaper to do the detail. It sounds sort of familiar with cracks in buildings. Um, so we start to see 
the principal agent change over just the design process. And then when we apply that from, from the perspective of trees, we've got... This happens all the time. So, so we have this issue where we have the policy maker saying we must have trees. Transferring the problem or the issue to the operational arm of council or the owner to say, plant the tree. The tree's planted, it's growing, the owner moves on, there's a new owner coming, what's this bloody tree here? It's getting a bit big and unwieldy. Who's going to manage it? Who's going to maintain it? Every time I ring up that tree lopping bloke, it's a thousand bucks, he's worse than the mechanic which is just as bad as the, you know. So it changes in terms of who values the tree and what do they value it for. So when we think about the urban landscape, we've got to think about it from a temple perspective. And we need to think about our trees not just as in the pure domain of the native. And I'll, I'll finish with the pigeon parrot. I was going to finish before, but I want to fit finish with the Pigeon Paradox. <coughs> and the Pigeon Paradox is essentially questions whether natives are the best. Now, it's a little, sometimes sacrilegious with the audience when I suggest those things. So I'm waiting to be egged. So, so the Pigeon Paradox is this. So I live in the middle of a city. My connection to nature is the pigeon. I go out and I feed the pigeon. You're the pigeon today. So I feed the pigeon. And the, pigeon, and the pigeon eats out of my hand, and that makes me feel good. I don't own a cat, I don't own a dog, and the pigeons come to me. And so this is my connection to nature. And then the ecologist comes along. Bloody pigeons, rats with wings, we get rid of them. And so they start a pigeon baiting program. And then we go and ask the person who is feeding the pigeon, oh, we'd really like you to value nature. Well, you just killed his nature. So, where I'm going with this story is, native trees are good. But if you had to choose between a locally native tree and nothing, or a locally native tree and something that a resident would like and care for, it might be slightly exotic, so long as it's not a noxious weed, let them have the tree. Plant as many locally natives as you can, you need that for biodiversity. But biodiversity and ecology with the threat and the loss of trees just needs trees sometimes. So that's where I'll leave you tonight. Thanks.